to see this? Obviously, okay. Um, what is it? Okay, now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to ask you something, and the moment you do it, the moment you get it, you have to start and clap, okay? So I'm going to ask you if you can think of five uses for this piece of paper. I want to see who can do it really fast. Five uses for this piece of paper. If you know it, just stand and start clapping. And I want to see how many of you can really do this. Nobody can figure it out. Stand up and clap. Stand up and clap. Let's see. Oh, only so many people. Only so many people. Oh my God. Oh God. Okay. That's a standing ovation right at the beginning of the session. So I'm done. Bye and see you. Okay. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm just kidding. Okay. I wanted to use that standing ovation for the uh, for, for the point I'm trying to make here. Our education system, or the education system, probably anywhere in the world, is one which is based on a lot of insecurity. Just like when I put this paper up and said, if you can find five things you can do with this, immediately there were some people who were saying, I have to I have to be first, and then a lot of people stood up, and the moment that happened, a lot more people were motivated to stand up and clap, right? Our education system is one that does the same thing. We have certain parameters, certain chapters, certain marks, these kind of rules, and then the moment that happens, we start marking children and also adults on it, and then some people are made to feel good, some people are made to feel really horrible. And Albert Einstein said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its life thinking it's a fool and that's what our education system has done and I believe there are geniuses right here and it's just a stroke of luck that I'm here okay it could have been you too and what I would like to do is to share with you how I'm trying to make this a reality I want every one of us to really be that genius that we can really be so my topic is really create and um, uh, I had um, I, I cannot use a formal PowerPoint like uh, blue screen and bullet points. I'll need to have the smileys. Okay, so this is really what it is. And my first sorry, my first slide is what is the real challenge, or what are the challenges that are facing our education system right now? The first is in terms of policies. Who makes these policies? Okay, who are the guys who make these policies? And what is their motivation to make such policies? Now, some of these policies are politically driven. It becomes a po political agenda for a lot of people to say, I brought this curriculum in. Okay? I'm not going to name names. We know it very well. right? The second thing is, the guys who make it are theoreticians from B.Ed colleges. I'm sorry if there are any B.Ed colleges here. But there are theoreticians who have never probably got down to teach at a different level. They are people who read a lot, they've done doctorates, they've done a lot of these kind of researches, but what do they really know about getting down and working with the child? And if you ask the teacher, she would probably say, I made him score a 90%. But did the child learn joyfully? Did he assimilate everything that he learned? There will be no answer. Okay? So these are the guys making the policies. And if you saw the Ken Robinson talk a few minutes back, that was Ed, he said, professors are people who use their body as a transport for the head. And I cannot agree more to that. I'm sorry to all the professors who are here, but I remember when I first started working in the field of creative education, there was a person by name Raphael Bait. He was a teacher, art educator from Scotland. And I used to work with him in the slums of India. And the first thing he said was, you know, Raphael Bait actually said, uh, in India, if you teach people how to teach, they will make it, make it a mechanical drill and they will make it chalk and talk in few minutes. We are experts at that. But we need to actually move beyond that and actually start working with uh, children. So who makes these policies? People who don't know anything about teaching. It's true. And I will agree even at the higher education level. Okay? And people who don't do will teach. This is something that we have to understand. And this is where curriculum models have to change. The doers have to come in to teaching and that's how the world will change and that's how the education system in our country will definitely go in for a change. Okay. So the second 
challenge that we have is in terms of needs. Now there was no history of formal education anywhere. India had the Gurukula system. There were apprentice models all over the world. Suddenly the industri industrial revolution came in and people realized that there were no uh, people to operate the machines that were invented. So the first curriculum model that was designed was designed keeping in mind the needs of the industrial revolution which was I need this guy to be able to operate this machine. Okay? And I need this guy to operate this machine and teach me how much money I can make at the end of this. Okay? So we still use that stupid model and children are still being taught one pen costs so many rupees. So if I need to buy five pens, how much money do I need? And we have these stupid questions going on and on and on and children are still sitting with the five pens and six pens when all over the world the needs need to be changed. And I will come back to the solutions and I will talk about how we have been able to make this. So we are not really targeting the needs. What would you take as a need? We have terrorism now, so peace could be a need. We have global warming now, so it could be environmental issues that can be a need. So there are several needs that we can start defining and it could vary from population to population. The needs can vary, but there will be some common needs across every culture and we have to respect those needs as well. The third challenge that we have is in terms of architecture. What happens in architecture? In 1687, Michel Foucault wrote a book on how architecture affects people. And he was able to write distinctively that a convent, a prison, and a school have the same architectural style. Okay? And so, because of that, because of that architectural style, what was the key element? Discipline and correction. Who comes in needs discipline or correction. So, okay, for the convent, discipline is fine. For the jail, correction is fine. But for a little child, isn't creativity important? So why not our architectural styles in schools change? So that is our third challenge, right? So coming back, our definitions of success. What is the definition? Well, how do we define a successful person now? Somebody with a lot of money? Somebody who comes on TV? Somebody who has a lot of power? Somebody who just commands people and they fall? These kind of things are the definitions of success. A person who is ethical, is he considered successful? Very few of us respect them. And that is where we need to realize that we need to redefine our definitions of success in itself. A successful person must be one who is passionate about what he or she is doing, who is able to be peaceful within and spread peace around, is ethical and who is able to inspire ethical values and principles in other people. Why should success always be linked with the commercial model that we are again trying to push in through our education system. right? The next challenge that we have, our education system doesn't know the difference between information, knowledge and wisdom. We give children a lot of information and they are expected to memorize this information and throw it up in the exam. If you don't literally vomit, you probably will not be in the top nine, uh, top 10 ranks. The ones who were intelligent were the backbenchers. Right? And I know many of us are here. I'm, I'm one too. Okay? So, so then comes knowledge. What is knowledge? Once you have the information and you start thinking about the information that you have, that's when you develop knowledge. And from that knowledge, when you start implementing it, get into experience, you start becoming wise. And that experience doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. You do. In fact, you make many more mistakes than other people because you're willing to take the kind of risks that are required. I hope I'm making my point clear here. Okay? And then, here I have to use an example. Now, parents who come to our schools, I run several schools, and um, parents who come to school immediately say, uh, will you make my child a, a gold medalist? Will you make him get a 90%? Will he get into so and so engineering college? Okay? And the child is probably two and a half years old. Okay? When he probably grows up, we don't know if he wants to do engineering, if he has an aptitude for engineering, but the mother has already decided engineering because her neighbor's son is already going into engineering college. Uh, we are now defining these things very uh, funnily. 
And now, you know how parents want to raise their child? They plant this tree. Imagine this is the child. I plant the tree. And every day, what I do is take this huge bucket of water. And then I pour the water saying, I am sending him for gymnastics. I'm doing, so I am doing that. Like 50 extracurricular activities. At the end of the day, child is probably like that. I don't know if you've seen that chocolate ad where, ad where this boy comes and says, Halwa khayega? And he says, yes, mama. Then go to the market and buy this, 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 this. Remember that ad? Our children are going through that. Because what would you, why would you want to drink this health drink? Because my mother has sent me for 50 different classes and I need the energy to handle all those 50 different classes and the stress of not performing in any of them. Right? So what do we do? We are actually sprinkling water like that at the surface level, it's not going to the root and the roots are not growing deeper. The roots are just on the periphery. And what happens? One wind and the tree falls. This is what our education system is doing to our children. And then there's this other set of parents who not only pour water across there instead of into the, the who would probably dig for the water, they do that and every once in a while put it out to see if it's growing. <laughs> Varying assessments. Coming back to the depth of knowledge, Again, I have to talk about how our education system is killing it. Now, have you seen these fashion shows in Paris and Milan and everything? Okay. The shorter the de dress, the more expensive, right? Okay. So there are a lot of schools and institutes high of higher education that charge a large fee for offering nothing. Right? And that's what is also happening. So we be careful. If you're paying a lot, a lot of parents say, fees konja kamiya arkunga. I nala school konja mosson na nikkeray. AC classroom. Why AC classroom? We are contributing towards global warming. Why not ventilation? Why are the 10 trees around the campus? We could simplify. Okay. Coming to our last, not the last challenge, most uh, amazing challenge that we are facing right now, commercialization of education. Who are the people who come into education right now? Every business that's failed, I have some money to invest. What will give me quick returns? College or school? Bang! And then what happens? Every every tree in Salem has this sun pack with with schools or with colleges. So finally, you don't know what the tree's bark looks like. So I'm sure if I go into a kindergarten classroom and ask a child, what is the color of a tree's bark? He'll say it's yellow and orange and blue and everything because they've not seen the tree yet, right? So this is what is happening to our schools and commercialization, there is no mentality of service in any educational institution right now. We don't want people who cannot pay. We do not want children who cannot perform because we are motivated by something else and that something else is very ugly right now, not in the field of education. You make your money anywhere else, please not in the field of education. So these are really our challenges. Okay? And I am going to just quickly run through with a couple of photographs about the kind of work I'm doing to show you that though I've mentioned the problems, the solutions are not very difficult. So I'm going into the solutions right now. So like I told you, there are several schools. Now that's one of my schools. It's a preschool. It's a stress-free education model. Now that's me with a little puppy in the classroom. Okay? Now the traditional way of teaching dog or pup to a child in our traditional school, we would not even use a picture in many schools. They would use the blackboard and then the spelling D-O-G will be written and the teacher will be sitting high and mighty on the chair and then she said, okay, D-O-G dog. Our traditional way of teaching would be a D-O-G dog. And finally, when the child goes to the exam, he or she goes and writes a G-O-D God, right? <laughs> so that's what happens. So to break away from that, we use something like a multi-sensory approach. For the early childhood education programs, we use something called a multi-domain approach. There are nine domains of development and within each domain there are subsets of skills. I'm not going to the details of this, but I'm just telling you that there are different ways in which you can do it. Respecting the needs of a child is through the multi-domain system. So when we teach domestic animals, for example, there are different ways in which it starts. And then a puppy is also brought into the class. Can you imagine how much children can enjoy that? Right? Would you ever forget if you learn this? No. See, we bring in an apple, for example. Okay? Normal way of teaching apple? A P P L E. Wow. You know the spelling. Great audience. Wow. Okay. So anyway, we have like the apple, right? So the simplest way to teach it is to probably put it on the blackboard and write A P P L E. 
and you'll be hundred percent sure that fifty percent of your class has not assimilated anything, right? But the only way to bring it in, bring in an apple, okay? Make all the children smell it first, okay? Because smell, the olfactory sense is one of the strongest senses we have. So make them smell it first. And then once that is done, let them touch it. Okay, it's smooth on the outside. Then we can talk about the color. It's red. Sometimes they're green, right? Is it smooth? All of this is done. And then finally you say, shh, we're going to cut it now. So you're also getting them to pay attention. And then you slice it into two. And the children are listening to that crisp cut, which also increases auditory discrimination, right? And then you say, first there was one, and now there are two. So you're bringing in elementary maths. And then you say, first it was red and smooth. Now it is white. It's also slightly wet. And it's rough. And there are seeds inside. Okay? You're developing the child's ability to research. You're developing the child's ability to look for differences, to compare. So many things are happening right there. And then the final bit, let them taste it. All your senses are taken care of. And the child feels on top of the world because every child personalizes that experience and feels totally on top of the world saying, my teacher was paying attention only to me. Because the child cannot see that she was paying attention to all of them because everybody got a bit to eat. Everybody got to touch it. Everybody got to eat it. All of this. And the child enjoys this whole experience of being wanted. So self-esteem. Everything is taken care of in just that one experience. And how much time does it take? The same 20 minutes that they would have shouted their throats out and still gone with mistakes. And after this, of course, the methodology of introducing the spelling and writing are also done in scientific methods. But if this is done, the learning is not forgotten. We need to understand that learning is different. Literacy is different. Education is different. Learning is different. Assimilation is different. We need to be very clear what our goal is. Going back, uh, and that's children planting a tree. They're taking care of it with their own little water can. I'm sure you, in, you know, when they do these things, they will want to do it again at home replicated at home. Why can't the school do it? See, schools, they say five acres of land. But which school actually teaches gardening every day? Why not? Of course, the CBSE curriculum has brought in gardening in a very serious way. And I'm glad they have, because I think that's one of the needs of the hour. Here, up here, our kids are make, doing a project in science. Now, you'll see the teacher is not interfering there. She's guided them. They've had a discussion. And she's just the children are making their own project and at the end of it there would be also a presentation. Now this kind of learning again leads to a lot more assimilation. Sunday they are learning pre-KG kids the basics of maths and also how to buy things in the market. Why don't we teach them early? Because once this happens I am sure they are not going to walk into a departmental store and ask for a bar of chocolate because they know it costs money. Again, um, here, here's a maths curriculum. Instead of doing the mechanical uh, uh, work that they have, they're making it out of charts, physical activity, one-on-one -on -one interaction, working, uh, working on stage. There are just endless things we can do. Now, you may wonder if all of this work is only in expensive schools. Okay? Now, these are not expensive schools. They're for middle-income families. But what I really am passionate about is what I'm going to talk about next, which is architecture. I mentioned, Michel Foucault mentioned, that a convent a have the same architectural style. And so the key is correction or discipline. So breaking away from that is where I design schools and classrooms. Thank you. Design schools and classrooms where children can actually enjoy what they're doing. So now that's a creativity lab. So this is where they put up their posters. They can display their things. Everything is to do with creativity. Now in that particular school, there are no classrooms. There are only labs. Children move from lab to lab during the day and they enjoy experiments. Okay? And then here, this is another school here in Salem where the classroom blackboard has been replaced by this little truck. Okay? The truck has a green board. Now when children come in, they are not shocked to see a blackboard. They are actually going to write on this dipper truck here. Why can't they enjoy it? Why shouldn't schooling be fun? Because we don't want to correct them. We want them to be able to think and to develop themselves. This is the pin-up board that they should know those boards be rectangular and boring. Why can't they be simple like this? 
I have my watermelon in the class. Why not? It's fun. And here, this is a science lab. The chairs are like giraffes. When children start learning in environments like this, even if they are diverted, even if they get bored, they have something that is related to the subject and they come back. So their learning of 40 minutes becomes more and more meaningful. Now, what I'm really passionate about, and okay, this person has talked about something fancy and is going to again work with only the rich, the people who already have. And in the morning session where the, Swede, the Swedish doctor was speaking, he talked about the economic disparity in India. We have to understand that empowering only one economic strata in our country is not going to get us anywhere. So what I'm really passionate about, I'm sort of like Robin Hood. I earn from these expensive schools and then siphon out the money here, right? The model of education here is for three rupees a child per day, we give them education, nutrition and medical help. Okay? And can you see this? Now the same model which I use in Kriti or in Kailash Mansur or all other kids is what I use in these villages. The only thing is they are low cost or no cost teaching materials. These are stones, jalli urkala, jalli painted. Okay? And you can tell them that they can put it in the pocket. Okay? Most of our teaching material comes out. I'm just kidding. But actually, that's how we prepare it. This is our small little school. Usually, humble uh, beginnings in most of our schools. Some of our schools are under the trees. We don't have buildings. Okay? Because we don't have the fund to actually invest in infrastructure there. But we want the child to have something qualitative. So we would have it in a small uh, under... And if it's raining, the closest shelter is where we would run to and we will have classes there. Up here, can you see what these are? Anyone guess? Not chalk. These are the sketch pen barrels that you throw away. You don't need it, but we can use it as teaching material. So we use it for threading. So we teach eye-hand coordination through these things that you throw away. Now our humble little slide here. We don't have outdoor equipment, so we have a humble little slide here. These are first generation learners. Now one program is for the two to six year olds and the other program is for what we call the supplementary education program for children who already go to government schools but cannot study at home because either they don't have the facilities to study there, the atmosphere to study there or the uh, support that they need. Like many children drop out because they are first generation learners who don't have somebody to teach them at home. So we have tuition in the evening and again because malnutrition is one of the reasons children cannot learn in India, we make sure that a nutritious meal is given. That becomes an incentive and it also accelerates their learning. So going back, see these are bottles that we throw away. We can use it for eye hand coordination. right? So several things that people actually don't have use for are what they give me and then I convert them into teaching materials, take them to the schools here. 400 schools like this and 18,000 children. And it's not easy to run these schools, but in the long run I know that 20 years from now we'll have empowered villages. And that is really the challenge of what we are trying to do in this. So the nutritious meal, the supplementary education. This is a gypsy slum, I want to share this. There's a group of gypsies and they would move from place to place. You will establish a school and then they will move from that place to another because they were migrant workers. So the first thing we did was we got a bus owner to uh, donate an old shell. We painted it, redid re the interiors and wherever this village goes now, they take their school along with them. It's as simple as that. Like I said, just get the pencil. You don't need to spend eight million dollars to develop something new. So all these teaching materials here, sticks, uh, coconut shells, all of this, soda bottle uh, lids that we have. This is how our country is. And we are still thinking about shelling out 40, 50 thousand rupees a year, probably a lakh to educate our children. It's time to start thinking to start doing something more meaningful for our country. And these are teacher training programs. Unless teacher is done, nothing will work. And a lot of schools come and tell me, teacher seri le, be it le, vanda unga seri le. Seri le na niye na panna. Did you spend enough time or resources to train them? Unless we train our teachers to think differently, it's not going to be a reality. So, coming to the last part, we need to work effectively, which is, Pareto, an Italian economist, talked about how you put in, most people in the world put in 80% of effort to get 20% of results. 
we need to work the other way we need to plan we need to think when we start doing that we can effectively manage putting in 20% of results the effort to get 80% of results right the second part of that is setting aside differences it's time we look beyond community caste religion all of these things that divide us if you look the origin of violence by amartya sen he talks about how people divide because they look for differences we are actually all the same and we just need to look beyond these differences and start working towards a better india and then of course we have to understand greed which is like the solution for commercialization we have to start saying no education that are commercial in nature we need to start looking at schools and colleges that will uh, hold quality standards at a very high level not people who will just give you an admission for whatever marks or skills you have but people who will be able to nurture success in people and then of course changing the mindsets of people which is going to take some time i'm going to end with something very important i talked about needs and how education started from the industrial education or schooling really formal schooling started from the industrial revolution what do we really need peace environmental issues i have written a question paper for children which i shared with my team a few days back i said okay we need to teach children that family is important why cannot a maths question be a father spends 3 hours of quality time with his son in a week how many hours of quality time does the child get with his father at the end of a month why can it not be like that why should always be one pen and two pens right the other question we can ask a wind turbine generates so much power in one hour and this saves the country so much money from thermal hydroelectricity why can't we do this solar power we can it's about renewable resources right in our curriculum in first and standard we don't need to do grand things but we have to respect the fact that our country is increasing in this economic disparity and that we have the responsibility right now to change it and our generation has shown itself to be more responsible than the previous one that depleted all the resources so if you are with me and if you feel as youngsters you can make a difference in our country i think it's time for you to look at the white paper because we can make a difference and we need to be the change our country needs thank you so much